I am welcoming the guest, Luca Pradalesi, a mixing engineer for over two decades, multiple Grammys, and some real heavy hits underneath his belt with Diplo, Drake, Skrillex. That all sounds great, but I haven't got him here for that. I've got him here because every year, year after year, I hear him get more creative with his mixes, and there's always a new ear candy and things that I'm latching onto, which I'm here to discuss with him. Luca, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited to have a chat with you. Super excited to be with you as well, Nicholas. How are you doing? Amazing. I think you can you can understand. We're here, we've made it, and we're going to have an awesome chat about your mixing process. Um, first thing, first time I, I connected with you was with your Pure Mix tutorial for the Major Laser record, compartmentalizing drums into the kick, low perk, high perk. That's six, seven years past, maybe even longer. Yeah. You're still working like this today? 1,000%. Still on that system. And I'm going to keep refining, refining my workflow, uh, my templates. And I have a vision. My vision is to minimize any technical side and priority to the creative side. And then whatever I can do to be in a state of flow when I'm working, that's always the key for me. So drums, related to drums specifically, and there's a question that I many, many times is, what about when you have four stems versus we have so many? Well, the grouping, it's about to divide the drum in a certain system, regardless if I have five stems or 50. So the way I've comp compartmentalized your technique there is I've used um, VCA faders for the low perk, the high perk, and the kick. So that way, when I'm just balancing and I want to feel it out, instead of having to go into 20, 30 stems, I've just got them all grouped or in parallel, and I just feel it out. In terms of like the creative flavor because i know that you know with the low perk you have parallel processes in there and whatnot when you're trying to get things like your low end or particular snare hits to pop what are you doing in the parallel particularly that uh, you're sort of leaning on a little bit like a bit of out of habit first of all i want to make sure that it's clear that as a mix engineer i'm reacting to the song i'm not executing always the same techniques uh by default so First of all, is production quality, sound design arrangement. I'm always want to be very, very specific because this is the key. So that's like, we kind of raise the bar from the production standpoint as far as the quality of the song. Now my job is a percentage base of how much I should do and I can do to improve what I'm getting or, and be creative to add something that retain the vision of the producer but then I'm adding something special. And to me, this is always, again, based on the material that I'm working with. Now, I have my go-to techniques, my go-to plugins, but my level of involvement on the track is really based on the production. We know as mixers in the studio, we can't use one plugin on every the same time, every single time over and over. Right. Now... Do you think that accessibility to hundreds of plugins for a, a mixer starting out is a benefit because they can explore lots of sounds? Or do you think it hinders them because mm -hmm. they have to lean more on, they're trying to lean more on the promises of these tools rather than, like you said, feeling out the production and trying to find what is going to work for the, that production itself? I think it's a great question. It's a great point. And I see uh, people abuse the, abuse the plugin as a, a way to try a different solution ideas, but without a clear vision what you really try to achieve from that plugin. And there is a certain comfort zone when you use a tool that you know really, really well. Uh, in my case, I cannot predict in my mind the sound that I'm trying to get and then I'm execute a decision. So. I want to do parallel compression on a kick. I know exactly when I put 1176 and I do a little bit of Q boost into 1176, we're going to get that type of tone. And then I simply open a plugin and I I'm going to execute a certain decision to achieve that result. If I'm dealing with a new plugin, there's so many variables. Uh, how the gain structure of the plugin works. How about the threshold? So, and then what I'm doing now, I'm studying and I'm trying and I try to learn the car that I'm driving, but I'm driving. So it's probably better to make as a separate um, session. So what I strongly recommend is pick your go-to tools. So what is your 
10 different between compressor, multiband, EQ, uh, reverb, those 10, 15 tools, those are your go-to, right? That's the plugin that take you in the past four or five years. That's your sound. That's the predictable result of using a plugin. Now, there's a plugin that catches your attention. You say, wow, new Clipper. How about if I do a shootout and now it's a Saturday, I'm off, I'm not in charge of a mix, but I'm just like study a plugin and I do a more critical listening, A and B in different cases. Now I'm learning a new tools and eventually that plugin might be in addition to my old Clipper or might be a replacement, but I'm, I'm not a huge fan of constantly reinventing. Um, there's also a specific reason you build in your your sounds using those tools. Those tools should be help you to be in a state of flow when you're using those tools, right? So if you get lost on the GUI and you look around trying to find, because it's a second time using that plugin, where is the mid-side function? Where is this? Now it's you're switching the energy. So it's better to say conservative as far as the use of the plugin, in my opinion. That's That's interesting because the way you talk about plugins is purely connected to the feel of what you're going to anticipate in the sound, how it's going to come out. People who know me know I'm very connected to the technical side of it because for me, that's just the way my brain is geared for engaging in mastering work is to understand, okay, if there's a phase shift here and there's a movement yeah. here, how's the fidelity in the top end, which is, I don't know if it's polar opposite to you because I can't speak on your behalf. I can only yeah. talk to your creativity. When people are picking out 10 to 15 plugins, do you think that that's, especially when it comes to mixing, because I, I, in mastering, that's where my focus is, but for mixing engineers, should they have some consciousness of those technical aspects to the plugin, or do you feel like they should just go with where the sound takes them? They should learn the car they're about to drive, because drive the car, right? So okay. you need to get familiar, but also need to get familiar with the limitations. But in my opinion, if you train yourself to avoid certain things, most likely you're gonna avoid issues regardless if the plugin is new or is not new. Okay, what, I, yeah. what I mean by that is if you understand, let's take an, an example, something that I'm uh, very interesting about, which is phase, and I know you're you're as well, you know if you are taking uh, an EQ that is not a linear phase and you do like a nice high pass, a nice 96 decibel, and you boost like 15 dB with a small little Q, uh, you most likely gonna have phase shifting like badly. So I think if you know that this is gonna happen, you can avoid more about educate yourself what you shouldn't do, uh, regardless if the plugin is new or not, you know? So what is a good time to use a linear phase uh, EQ versus not? Uh, I see so many sessions coming through or even YouTube uh, we do like like 25 dB of push, like a 5K or like cutting, um, not in a linear phase. And then imagine myself to see this huge phase shifting happening right before and after. So those things, you can avoid it regardless if the plugin is new or is not. That's actually something I was uh, I was touching on a session yesterday. And just just having that technical knowledge helped me navigate. A bit. There, was, there was stacks of bass there. So I'm yeah. like, okay, I can't put different EQs on these stacks because they all make one sound. Otherwise the whole tone is going to change. So that way, what I did is I linked all the EQs. So that way all the phase shift moved together. Cause I didn't want to make a group. I was a little bit lazy. I was like, no, I'm not right. That. But, um, <laughs> but well, um, also what about, there is a big trend or make things sounds very, uh, pristine as far as like top ends with a lot of sharp transients using a lot of, you know, expander, which is a trend of design is like, yeah. it's a really big expander. Right. But then, this has been done correctly and there's so many sample packs from splice and other where they have so many issues as far as like out of phase of like wrong layering of like kick and snare when you start to put like a kick drum you download from splice there's so many issues because there's like three layers inside of one layer it makes sense inside of one stem and it's out of phase and now you put a multi-band transient designer and you want to have a spike of like 5k to a little top ends of the kick, you most likely gonna enhance the phase issue 10 times more. So now you're bringing problems out of, to the surface. You bring the low level information up you know, to the top. For that reason, I recommend strongly to 
make sure that you understand the source quality of your sound. Your kick is in phase, should put in phase first and then process later. I, I agree. And as you're saying that to me, I, I think we both connect with this when um, uh, mixes get sent to us for mastering and we see the waveform and we can see the, the big spike and then we start cranking it on our speakers. And because the sample is out of phase, we hear the sub not being in time with the main transient and we're like... Exactly. Yeah. What's, what's happening? And the issue is that a lot of people don't understand the limiting and clipping. It's fantastic, but you, you gonna bring low level information on the mix up. So all the little subtle mistakes that are sitting like 20 dB under, now they're gonna start to come up in order to come up even more. So I think, uh, starting from a quality production, going into a quality arrangement where you minimize the number you minimize the number of layers happening and you do proper side chain to create space. And then now you go to mixing, to mastering. I think there's a way to have almost like compound effect of like quality happening from beginning till end of the song. But then easily you can damage if you start for something that is being damaged from the beginning, you take till the end. You just keep exacerbating, it's worse and worse yeah. and worse. So I, I started at the end there. I was like talking about mastering. Let's bring it back. Uh, yeah. probably a hundred steps, somebody sends you stems to mix. Now you talk about, um, previously we spoke about the, the drum setup, the low, low perk, high perk, but in terms of when you get your stems and you start setting it up, is there a particular organization that you go by in terms of, um, clip gaining or manipulating or editing, or do you tend to keep it to what the producer's got? What do you, maybe the best question to ask is when you get those stems, what are you listening out for to improve before you even start processing anything? That's great. So gain staging wise, I'm going for zero dB view, minus 18 full scale, and that's across the board. And I do that because I want to make sure that my song is open to work on this desk. If I want to go hybrid and my desk behave much better when I go about minus 18, um, the zero dB view is kind of like my point of reference of summing. So everything that we prep is all the zero dB view. In this way, any type of like preset, any type of like chain that want to replicate is going to kind of behave in the same way all the time based on the gain stage. So the gain stage is essential. That's number one. Number two to me is phasing. And once again, I want to make sure that when I'm listening, it's right. And then if I feel the kick drum, it's being stemmed out as a one kick but there is multiple kicks inside. I might call the producer and say, hey, if you don't mind, send me the individual layer of the kick and got to put in phase myself. So all this to me is a prep work for the mix. I'm not mixing. I'm prepping, try to get the best possible uh, settings. Um, and then from there to me is like stereo bus treatment, drum bus treatment at the beginning. And I do a little test mastering. I call stress mastering where I'm going to, kind of like understand the level of dynamic range of this mix from the point zero. So I want to see how much dynamic left on this mix we have. And then what I do, I want to see if I do the most basic limiting, even running through the desk or I do in the box, I want to see where the track is breaking up first. And that will help me to kind of like keep in the back of my mind, say, okay, I have a low end um, pile up of frequency, I have a low end uh, that uh, is going to really make the song sound suffer as far as like limiting and make the track sounds loud. So I try to get a loud mix, which is like potential, very loud master um, from the beginning. That's good because I know a lot of people like in the EDM world, like slap an L1 mix, producing to it at the very least, get a feel from it. But yeah. one thing which... Uh, people who are experienced mixers working with producers will know, and people who are starting out are going to find out very quickly, is that when you shift the phase of the kick drum, the tone can change quite a bit. Like as yeah. in, when you get it in, when you get it tight, it's going to punch harder. It's going to change some of the tonal characteristics. Sometimes you lose that phasey top end, and then by losing that tone, it can shift the feel of it a bit. Be honest, is it a hundred percent strike rate when you've phase align kick drums for producers or sometimes do they like the original one a little bit better? You know, it's uh, sometimes I had question like, oh, wow, you changed the kick. Is a new kick drum? It's like, no, it's your okay. kick. 
in phase, right? So what I do, I use SSL X phase. The purpose is to, it's a plugin to fix the face, but visually I don't see anything. So I go by feeling. And when I fix the face of a kick drum, I'm not necessarily fixing the face. I'm adjusting the face till the point that I they feel right to me. And that's about my sensibility. So, and I do this like crazy short loops. They're like F beat. And then I move across the kick drum going from kind of like the angle of the kick. And I follow right after the, the attack of the kick. I want to I want to hear the beginning of the decay and the ending part. Um, and just like, and I move the face till the face feels right to me. Not necessarily it's perfect. But then I bring, the way I can describe a proper phase kick drum feels instead of being outside of the speaker on the side, it feels like in the center. And then you have a little bump of level and a little bit of thickness. If the kick is sitting on top of an 808, or any type of bass, then this, this, the second step is fix the kick now, open the bass, do the same test. Um, and yeah, and I'm, I find myself using, if it's something very extreme, I just like, move the face, but then the SSL X phase is super nice. I can just literally move around and find the sweet spot. Sometimes I've experienced when you're perfectly in phase, it changes so far away from the original that I end up going back to it and being like, oh, well, maybe these two layers I'll keep perfectly in phase because it's all the punch in the subs, but these other three layers, yeah, you're going to go back to normal because this, this isn't working out. It's, it feels a bit weird. So yeah, that's, that's actually a really, uh, that's, I learned from that now. So as in yeah. from you, from sharing that with me, um, yeah. and, and Nicholas, cool. another point that I like to share during my workshop, because we spend a lot of time talking about phase is okay. Now we put on phase or the phase feel okay. How are you going to process your kick drum with the next plugin after you're fixing the phase? Don't put on phase, yeah. don't put out a phase again. So if you use a, an EQ, think about it. You want to do some maybe shelf or you want to do stay away of crazy high pass, low pass filter um, that'll give you like this, like, you know, phase shifting happening. So you want to be very specific and think about it, what you're doing when you process uh, an element that now it's in phase. You don't want to put it out of phase again. And if you want to do any type of parallel processing, think about that as well. So. What kind of EQ, what kind of compressor you're putting? So there is so many elements, but then when you train yourself, then most likely this is going to be part of your workflow. You're not thinking, but initially I think you want to spend time to make sure that you fix the phase and you keep the phase good till the end. And you actually, that, that, that's really interesting because all these techniques we talk about, um, and especially that, that you explained, we're, we're intimately close with, like we do every single day, we're in the studio. Yeah. We, we run these parallel chains, we, we, we get these stems in, we, we hear it, we see it yeah. day by day. Um, something that's really interesting is, is part in part of that is that it's, it's natural. It's already learned to us when it comes to like, um, cause you, you work with not just big mixers and producers, you work in that you've got my mix lab, you've got your whole education branch of what you do. Um, you engage with a lot of producers who are trying to build up these skills and learn them. How do you find like, what, well, how do you find they are starting with? Like, what are the common things they're doing in their mixing? Not necessarily their production, but their mixing, which is hurting them. And how well are they implementing a lot of the advice you give out? Because the thing is, you have a lot of videos on YouTube, which are great, on my mix lab, which are great, which people can take and work with. How are you finding they're engaging with it to actually help their mixing um, along? Uh, mixing engineers, they're coming from a production background. They're actually producer. They want to get better understanding of mixing with the purpose not to become me that I mix every day for other producer, but just be a better mixer for their own production. There is one risk, and I see this happening so many times. They get they fall in love for mixing to the point they minimize the time on proper sound design. <clears throat> and doing that, they quickly build a song, and then now they try to fix everything during the mixing stage versus say, wait, think about a Skrillex, right? Skrillex is an extremely uh, technical sound designer, more than a mixer, right? So it, because he's such a good producer uh, with the skills to do incredible sound design in his own production, the mixing, it's essentially a result of that type of quality. 
So I'm not saying mix is not important, obviously. I'm saying is you should balance if you are producing and mixing at the same time to invest the right time to get the best quality of production from sound design. And then from there, any type of mixing techniques that you develop or you learn, it's going to be the same, but with a less percentage on top of your uh, own production. Uh, so when we're talking about getting something that's out of phase, and me and you, we spend 50% of the time to fix in the phase, the other 50 EQ compression, and we move on, it's a proportional of the quality of the production. Now we're getting something spectacular from Skrillex. My time on fixing the phase is zero, literally. Everything is so on point. And my time now is allocated to do micro little things that improve separation, trends of response, overall uh, musicality from something that is incre incredible from start. So we do major label clients and indie clients. A lot of indie clients, they come and they say, hey, I heard, again, you mentioned Jay Balvi, and we heard like Drake. Uh, I send you a song, make it sounds like that, you know, make it sounds like Drake. And then unfortunately, sometimes, sometimes it's great, sometimes so far off from so many details. Again, the quality of the sound, the the the, the envelope of like a kick drum or like the phase of uh, use distortion with post reverb that creates so many issues. So, so many little things that if you focus back to the basic of getting the best source, then I can really help you to make your track sounds like Drake. I, th I think you touched on like so many aspects of um, things people get lost in because the idea of, or, or the technical concepts of phase aligning and, and the mixing processes we do are attractive because of the results they get. Yeah. But they are, the only reason they're getting those results are because the source material that comes before it is in a certain manner. And if that source material is banging from the start, like yeah. I said, with the Skrillex records, instead of stressing as a mixing engineer to be like, I got to get this phase aligned, I got to organize all this, you just get into the creative. And that's like how you've set up your sessions and compartmentalized everything. So yeah. instead of thinking of the technical, you're thinking of the creative. Um, and that and that's something you've developed again over time. Workshops are done with you earlier on with the pure mix stuff. Now it's five, six years later. I think you probably have learned much more as an educator and an experienced professional. I know you're bringing workshops around and I'm really yep. curious to know how, like we watch you online. We see what you do. We, we, we enjoy it being in a room with you. What, what, what is, what is getting offered differently in these workshops? How, how do you actually, you know, it's funny. I'm going to ask this for myself because I'm very selfish. I want to <laughs> do workshops. So how, what goes into planning workshops? What's, what's behind the valley of putting something like that together? The biggest difference on live event that I love doing it. And I, do, I did for a while. And then as a long break during COVID, it's that those 20 person in the room or 25 or 30 those guys are gonna kind of like feed me with what I should share with them versus on video. By default, I share information that will be useful for everybody. And then you can pick, say, oh, wow, I was not really into reverb uh, processing. This is good for me. And one was like, oh, I'm really into kick and bass relationship. This is for me. In the case of a physical workshop with me, there is a initial one hour that I'm getting a lot of feedback from everyone. And then now the next three, four hours is ded dedicated to them. Uh, and I try to kind of have everybody involved um, in a way that is personalized for the room instead of being generalized, you know, for the, the YouTube followers or the Instagram or the Mimix Lab. It's very personal. Um, the, I have a structure, obviously. I know what I want to share. But the level of details on different parts is based on what my students looking for during the class. Do you, do you know what that reminds me of? Yeah. Tw 20 years ago, you might have read read books like Mixing with the, uh, the Secret yeah. of Mixing or, you yeah. know, like all those books and whatnot. And you're just focused on whatever it's got to give you. Yes. And everybody's experienced this. You go visit somebody at their studio. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, whoever it is, they've got a new plugin, they're doing a particular mix. They show you something and you're like, oh, I wonder how you do this. Or they're like, I'm struggling with this. How can I help? And then you just jam it out. And it, it, feel, it feels like that's the nature of what you're describing to me, which uh, that's is kind of what cool. it is. And I think also the, there is a certain element on the environment based on the Q&A that's happening during the, the, the event that changed the course of my next two, three hours. So what I'm trying to say is we started and then I'm open every 15, 20 minutes to get questions. Those questions trigger other questions. And now we switch a little bit of focus based on those questions. And now we keep progressing or mixing. We take a song from the beginning till the end. But then the, again, the focus is moving based on the student's request. And out of curiosity, doing these workshops, have you ever learned something from the students? Have they ever asked a question that you've thought, oh, I haven't, I haven't thought of that before? Uh, so the part that was... Uh, most the, the most revealing part of this was as an educator to see oh i should pay attention because the real needs on the audio work is this so those 20 uh guys in the room multiplied for like five six different events in different city in different countries it gave me a data of like oh wow there is a there is a really needs of understanding of phase alignment, like kick uh, and, and bass relationship, vocal. It's, so it, I have more a real life experience what, you know, the industry needs. And as far from me learning, I do. So at the end of the session, we do listening of everybody's mixes. And sometimes there's like incredible uh, sounding mixes, you know. So and then we all are students of our passion for what we do. So all, always learning. Yeah. How crazy is it? When you hear like uh, people starting out, they might be at SAE, they might be a student at, at a particular uni or Berkeley or online course. And it's embarrassing because their mixes are so good. Yeah. They put you to shame. It's it's like, <laughs> like, I wish I could have done this when I was 18 or 19 or however young they are. It's wild what's coming out. That's very true. That's very true. And, and the part sometimes is unfair. It's sometimes they don't have access to quality production to mix. But then if they do have quality production to mix, now, you know, they can really shine. They can really bring some amazing ideas. Uh, one part about dealing with songs that are not properly produced, that you invest so much time to fix the foundation of that song, mixing-wise, that you don't have enough energy or time to focus also on the creative because you are fixing the song, you know? You're almost co-producing at this point. You're like just going into the production to do like, micro decision and fixing things um when a production is like that that you have to do so much fixing it's almost like a, a, a room full of dominoes you spend yes. the whole day f setting them up and then if you press somewhere wrong the whole yeah. mix just collapses and it's up oh, that's that's the end of like you got to go back to session backup file from 3 30 an hour ago and then find that because you knew it was okay then but the last hour you just destroyed it that's very true, Nicola. If I want to add something, take this opportunity to make like a micro little introduction or workshop in like two minutes is on a messy production quality. The first thing that you should do, it's mute everything that is not relevant to the foundation of the song and just first get the essential to feel right. So the kick, snare, synth, bass, be essentially good as a, and make the song to stand up without the other 15 layers, there are fillers, but just get the kick, snare, bass, and synth move together right, and then introduce and deal with other issues as far as like, oh, there's like three or four layers of fighting between synths. But then if you don't fix the foundation of the song, again, the kick and bass and snare and synth, you're going to have your brain fighting with so many elements, you're going to end up with an average mix versus if you get the nail element sounds really good. Work together really well. The rest can just feel in. What, what I'm what I'm curious is, I do similar. Whenever I start up a mix, I always find like the core. If if everything, how could this song be released and yeah. sound like a song without the uh, twenty of the elements? Like just find the three, four, five elements which work. But with that, sometimes when people produce, they produce with things really quirky, like a super big 808 or a really weird snare drum that's smacking loud. And that's part of their creative decision making. How do you manage that aspect of it, of going, wow, this is a really quirky direction, but we need yeah. to keep it, we need to keep it controlled. Like it has to feel good, but we need it 
satisfy the client, the artist, whatever, whoever they might be. So that way we still keep that quirk that they signed off on, on the production floor. Yeah. I, I feel that a lot of producer, they work with reference track. So now they are taking, let's say like uh, Travis Scott, perfect, finish, done, produce, mix, master song as a reference. And they keep, keep A and B with that one. Right. So now they try to do way too much early on. So now they're working on the 808 kick and snare, but then they're comparing something that's like the perfect dynamic range and the right limiting. They're fighting too much to do too much too soon. So what I always recommend is think about it to make it where mixing during the sound design is not mixing, it's just sound design. So using like plugins to achieve a certain sound. Then when you do that, now the mixing mindset as a mixer, it's happening way later. This means like three days later, when you go back to your own song, you commit every song, every sound, every stem as a track. Now you don't have the temptation to go into Serum or like any type of plugin and change the sound. That's a commitment right there. And now you're mixing. So too many people, they try to do everything in one session. Uh, you know, in the typical, I see co-producer working together, say, Hey, make, you know, that kick and snare sounds like, you know, the weekend. Well, the, the weekend file that you listen on Spotify, it's not the weekend producing is the weekend is being produced, sound design, arranged, mixed, mastered. So go with that next step, you know, and also they leave room for excitement and understand the song can grow over time. Um, so many rough mixes, you probably receive rough mixes. They're like kill the song they squeeze too much now there's no more life no, nothing to do sometimes i find myself when i get a rough mix like that to say well that's a final record what you don't like what you try to achieve let's go back into that song you know you did way too much that's actually really funny sometimes i get a production mix and a rough mix so the production mix the producer signed off on and then the producer tried to mix it gives a rough mix the production mix always feels like there's there's something there's like a gut instinct that feels good about it and then when they've you know watched a hundred of youtube videos where you have to cut the low end here and you have to do this compression ratio xyz and then they cookie cut their production it yeah. stops having feel and i think that's what's really good about uh, at least the way i connected with the way you work is that instead of trying to cookie cut every like go kick drum layer one kick drum layer two kick drum layer three EQ this frequency, compress this ratio for every single channel, which is mundane and it ends up with a stale mix. It was more top down. Let's look at it. And the kick drum, how does that meant to feel? Where's that meant to hit you? How's the bass meant to move? How's that meant to hit you? And then you develop, develop that over, over, um, the course of the mix, which, yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing that kills me, uh, a final mixes. I agree. And sometimes we forget that, uh, 808. Hi-hat, open hi-hat is an actual frequency. So uh, sometimes the hats is just 3 dB too low. And sometimes see people taking an EQ and try to EQ uh, uh, hi-hats from an 808 where you just need to pull the level up 3 dB and now we are pushing the 5K. Yeah. Makes sense? Instead of bringing a 5K EQ and pulling it up. So I think especially when you're trying music, uh, gain staging, a proper leveling, you are really doing a lot of work on the mixing that you're going to minimize the number of EQ, uh, the number of automation when you do a proper level at the beginning of your mix. And then the grouping the, and the buses, it's a way to speed up the process, but also to keep the integrity of the mix. Like you said before, very important. If you have three layers of snare, you start to go in solo mode, EQ each individual snare, that now you're reproducing, you're producing again, you're changing the intention of the song, you're changing the intention of the producer. Yeah, which which doesn't work for anybody. You get back Bix notes uh, saying, what did you do to my song? Can you, yeah, I, I, I understand. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm curious because you're talking about gain staging and I'm assuming from workshop to workshop, most of the students wouldn't have large format studios or lots of analog gear at their disposal. When it comes to teaching them gain staging, just so they even get the practices right, what, how do you, you know what, I don't even have a, a question for this other than how do you approach that for them? Because a lot of them have got their laptop in front of them, they're on the road, they're in Ableton or FL, 
producing, they want to mix it, but they want to do gain staging. How 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 is that getting how are that how is that getting taught? The way I can describe it is take the loudness part of the song, take like the second chorus, the drop, where all the elements are together. So we take that as a peak level of the song, and we want to make sure that when we bring all together, we set a certain space. So means like for me, the zero dB VU, it's kind of like a, a, a starting level of every song. So when you produce, you might produce too loud, but then when you start to export stems, you can gain stage as a one. So essentially you select your 50 stems and just lower everything if you're happy about your rough mix. So the relationship between kick and snare and bass and synth makes sense for you. Then lower everything where in your meter, you leave enough room that if you decide to take an EQ, a pro Q, and push 10 dB or 5 dB in the mid-range, you're not going 10 dB over zero, uh, if it makes sense. Yeah. You want that type of bedroom. A lot of people say, well, you don't need it. You're working like in 32-bit floating point, working 64. You're never going to clip. It's not about that. It's about to create a predictable way of working. Then if somebody send me a song and we have a success, now we do a follow-up single in a year. I want to reopen my kick treatment that I did on the previous song. I'm not worried about, oh, wow, now the threshold is doing 15 dB of compression. I need to readjust everything because if I retain the same gain staging, the compression is going to be the same. My dynamic EQ eventually will work in the same way just because based on level. So and to me, it's a, it's a way to kind of like be again on a state of flow when you're working, no go back and be the technician, you know? So you you have a car, you go back and fix the car and drive, fix the car and drive. No, just drive. Don't fix the car. Yeah. Wow. You know, you know it's funny. A lot of what you've spoken about um, there with, with the whole workflow are things which I actually can't even say come naturally over periods of time. It's the stuff that we have lost our hair over um, learning over a decade plus session yeah. after session. Oh, if I want to import this kick drum, it's not working. Okay. Let's create a system for that. Oh, we want to, you know, even with the gain staging thing, because in my mind, I'm in complete opposition. I'm like 32 bit when I'm mixing, I don't care, but I've got the practices in my gain staging yes. for each channel that it's never been a stress for me. Exactly. Um, because it's it's such a backwards thought, like it's so buried back, it doesn't. But you 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 compartmentalize that really well, especially for producers. And if they're working with the same artist, multiple projects, a year later they come back, they want yeah. to mix it to this certain style. That's really that that's exceptional because um, there's nothing worse than, uh, especially when a producers work with an artist over let's say two three years, they want to put an album together, and then they've like three years later the producers develop their technique really well, um, but. The, the track from three years ago doesn't doesn't fit the vibe at all and they can't pull that information or cross 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 pollinate it um, very true and also we are in a moment now where it's very popular to do co-production there's so many producers to like to work with other producer now if you do a proper job of like mixing a certain way you find yourself you to build a compilation you're not building an album you're building a compilation of different songs versus be careful about how you treat your sound in a way that every song tells the story instead of being every song is coming from a different source. Uh, one great thing about the 80s, in my opinion, and also the 70s, was the limitation of gear. Having an SSL 4000 where the same EQ and compressor was multiplied 32 times, it was a way that you have limitation that push you first to be a better engineer, but two, to have a sound that you can replicate. So now, you know what I mean? So now you go, yeah. you make a, a song with those tools, you force yourself to go back to use the same tools every time. So now you make songs sound part of an album. Now there's too much uh, options where you risk to have 15 different types of EQ based on the source, you know? And then you have too much that takes away the organic part of mix in one space. That also that also goes so far back to what you're saying about production and sound design. 70s, 80s, they're in the space. The drummer might be playing on a Slingerland snare drum and it's got a little bit too much ringing out. So they're like, let's change it for a Ludwig. So they're in the recording, actively producing or what we can say is sound designing because they'll change the strings on the guitar. They'll change the pickup. They'll change the amp because 
they've only got that SSL sound. So they know when it comes through, oh, we want it to be a bit brighter. We're going to use a tally on this instead of a Stratocaster because this SSL on this EQ is going to... So it's 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 actually funny. It's, it's not anything wildly new. It's no. just all new technology in the way we interact with it and have to engage with it. And that's like a contemporary issues producers face. In the electronic scene, it's exceptionally hard and difficult because... A lot of people start learning from whatever software they can get, whatever sample packs they can get, whatever synth they can get, whatever YouTube advice they can get. They push it all together and they've got these creative ideas, but they can't translate it. And then the mix struggles. And then I think there's very few people in this space at your level that are able to teach it in a practical way that translates to the way the industry works. Because oh. the way the industry works is completely, uh, completely different to what people see online for the most part. I, I think we, we can both agree. Like what, what is said online and what happens in the real world are two different things, but I think you're, at least for the electronics scene, is a great bridge, a really good bridge on that. I uh, Thank you so much. I, I agree 100%. And the fact that YouTube give you access immediately to too many information that some of those, you should filter those. You should filter some of those. And then, the fact that when you watch your video or my video, now YouTube will give you option to watch more videos. You almost go, you're going on autopilot, trusting or like trigger ideas and keep going, keep going. So um, especially with my mix lab, the idea was to make a place where it's, yes, YouTube, there is like a little bit of teaser what we're doing, but then you go into my mix lab as a platform and there is a filter curated uh, educational platform that even those 10 minutes snip of tricks, different tricks, they're like coming from experience. And then, uh, yes, there is a little bit too much out there. Uh, and a lot of people get confused. Also, there's a sort of excitement, I believe, on young producers. They get excited about getting a better on mixing. And again, I mentioned this earlier, very important. And now they're taking attention away from one skill and move and push to the another skill, where I strongly recommend, in I, and I like to I like to make this example to become an incredible guitar player first, then pick the guitar that give you and be able to translate your emotion instead of going crazy to buy guitars and get the best guitar, but then you're not learning the techniques, you're not working on your emotion. Um, and on mixing is the same, you know, sometimes I do way less. One of the questions from a lot of my students, when they see my sessions, especially on live events, say, oh, wow, you don't have a lot of plugging going on. You don't, you don't use a lot of plugging. You, you do way less than I thought. Because mixing doesn't mean bring a lot, it means mixing. And sometimes mixing is just like levels. It's not, a, it's about knowing what to do. And sometimes what to do is yeah. not to do much at all. Because exactly. you can push, I think everybody's experienced it. They've they've actually got a really good mix. They've went to master it. They've done all these notches, all these scoops, everything. And the whole feel is gone, evaporated exactly. into the air. And it's like, well, that's, that's, that's a waste. Um, so you're, you're completely right there. It's about knowing what to do and knowing it well from the core, building it forward. Um, Luca, I'm, I'm going to be exceptionally respectful of your time because I'm being honest, we, we could go on this for another hour, another two hours, oh. another three hours. And I've got half a mind to be very selfish and just keep going, but I'm <laughs> going to be really respectful of your time. And I know you've got a lot on your plate. Something you've got on your plate at the moment is the workshop tour. And I want to give you, you the opportunity to tell me about it. And yeah. I may have some questions and keep you here for a little bit longer if I do. Amazing. Yes. So I'm about to go on tour i'll be on the road from end of march till middle of april i'm excited it's something that feed so much energy to me just be on the studio with other engineers uh we're gonna start for um ultra in miami and then from there we're gonna go across europe on abbey road institute studios again miami paris uh amsterdam then we're gonna go to italy um which is i'm very excited which is my only italian speaking workshop that I do, um, I'm excited about that. We go to Poland for all the details of the workshop tour, go on the studiodmi.com and you get everything there. 
Um, so super exciting. I'm going to have guests. I'm excited. I'll go to Ultra. I have a lot of friends, clients of the studio coming through the workshop. So I'm, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. And this year I'm bringing something different. So the first hour, we're going to open some of the biggest mixes here from the studio. Uh, a couple of from Drake's, some from Skrillex, some from Diplo, something that other students might relate to as far as like the sound and decisions. And then we're going to open a brand new song and apply those techniques or those like that mindset on a brand new song. And then we're going to work all together in the room on that mix and then back the conversation that we had. There's going to be a lot of triggered by questions. So it's just like based on the feedback in the room, we're going to dive more specifically in certain parts of the mix. Oh, that's exciting, man. I, I am wishing you the best of luck for it. I Thanks. hope to see a lot of photos, any footage that you can share with, with us people who can't travel halfway across the globe, I think we'd, we'd love to see. Um, Amazing. But no, I, I, I do, any, anybody who's watching, I know there's, there are a lot of people who watch the channel who in the States and Europe, um, Luke is exceptionally kind with his, with his time, with the way he interacts with people. I've met Luke in person back in 2020 when, um, uh, Pinaxa introduced us. Uh, he, 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 it's, there's no need to feel intimidated or as though, um, he's, he will judge you on any question. He will, he's only there to help. And even, even outside of these calls, I've hit you up before and you're, all, you're always kind. You're always, never, okay. never an issue. So look, I, I really do, um, encourage anybody in, in the areas, I'll leave links in the, in the description below to check it out. And, um, yeah, even, even hit up, I know L Lucas team is incredible. Your the team and people you have around you is really incredible too. If you have any questions and you hit them up, um, they're always been exceptionally hardworking and diligent, um, whenever I've had to deal with them. So yeah, you should be very proud of this, Luca. So I, I do Thank commend you so him on this. Thanks for the great words. I really appreciate it. No worries. Well, th thank you for your time and, and um, we'll speak soon. Talk very soon. Take care.